Good morning to everybody watching and to all our participants who are on today's COVID-19 uh, public meeting briefing. I want to thank our local and elected healthcare leaders for this, joining this briefing today all virtually. The updates you provide each week are invaluable not only to me, but to everybody watching at home. Thank you all for your hard work. With that, I'd like to introduce Director of Fargo Cass Public Health, Desi Fleming, to provide an update. Desi. Good morning, everyone. Um, just a quick update on state numbers. Uh, from yesterday, we had 644 positive cases in the state out of approximately 15,000 tests and 17 currently hospitalized with uh, 13 deaths in the state. As far as Cass County numbers, um, 255 positive out of 3,391 tests and six deaths within Cass County. As far as testing, we're still encouraging anyone who is symptomatic or has had an exposure to a COVID positive person to contact their healthcare provider and seek testing. At this point, there's not unlimited testing in our area, but we expect some things will open up at some point. So we are hopeful also for um, antibody testing that might help us to determine exposures within our community that were undetected or asymptomatic, as this will help us determine potential immunity going forward if we would have a resurge of COVID in our area. Uh, the CDC team remains in Bismarck. There's seven members now that are in our state. They are helping with planning and determining testing strategies. They are recommending um, several targeted testing events, um, doing several congregate living settings, such as long-term care within our county. These sites are determined by incident command at the state level, and then they're handled by the National Guard strike teams. In these testing type of events, both staff and clients are tested in an effort to identify more positive cases. I just wanted to give a little bit um, about public health behind the scenes in all of this. Um, I know there's many opinions on how our city and state has handled this pandemic. Lots of questions to come on what's next. So I wanted to give from a public health perspective, just some of my thoughts. Um, first of all, public health successes are defined by what's prevented and not by what's produced. So sometimes those efforts are often taken for granted. With all of the prevention practices put in place during this pandemic and all of the restrictions, our goal was to have very limited disease and death. And because we've had those lower impacts in our area, people may say that we reacted excessively. But I do believe that if we hadn't done the measures we did, that we may have seen a very different outcome. But because of those efforts, we were able to better flatten our curve. It's hard to play catch up in a pandemic, which is why we need that proactive approach. There's no way to quantify the number of people that did not get sick because these preventative practices were put in place. There's a dynamic called the preparation paradox. And that refers to how preventative measures can intuitively seem like a waste of time either before or after the fact. Um, this is noted in a quote by one epidemiologist who states, you won't ever know if what you did personally helped. That's the nature of public health. When the best way to save lives is to prevent a disease rather than treat it, success often looks like an overreaction. So as the discussions of loosening restrictions begins in the weeks ahead, we all need to be really aware that COVID isn't just going to disappear quickly. We need to continue to use good judgment to be aware of our surroundings and continue to practice all of the things that we've learned that lower our risk. And what I really hope is that we can take away all the things that we've learned, such as good hand washing really does decrease the potential transmission of germs, that physical distancing does decrease the potential droplet spread between people, that disinfecting surfaces routinely does decrease the potential germ spread to others. These things should be our new behavioral norms going forward for this continued event and for every cold and flu season to come. If we can apply that knowledge gained from this pandemic experience, then that will be our public health silver lining going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Desi. Our next speaker is Clay County Public Health, Kathy McKay. Kathy? Thank you. Um, our Clay County numbers, um, we have 68 positive to date, and we do have three deaths now. Our total numbers in Minnesota, um, the positive cases are 2,567. We want to provide some information about why we need to keep following our current guidelines to keep our communities safe. Herd immunity protects most of the population, and with COVID-19, 
that will be achieved slowly. When most of the population is immune to an infectious disease, this provides indirect protection to those who are not immune to, to the disease, and that is what we call herd immunity. Two ways we achieve that is if a large proportion of the population either gets infected or if a large proportion of the population is vaccinated against the disease. We would likely need about 70% of our population to be immune to COVID-19 to achieve that herd immunity. According to our latest census data, the, our fargo moorhead metro area has a population of over 229,000. So in order to achieve herd immunity, we need about 160,000 to either be immune or to be vaccinated. And of course, we do not have a vaccine currently for COVID-19, and we really do not want the 70% people getting getting uh, COVID-19 to achieve that herd immunity, which would really overwhelm our healthcare systems and would really lead to a high death rate. So it's really important to follow our current guidelines, such as social distancing, we, which we regularly talk about. And then this virus could um, slow down and hopefully not infect as many people in the coming months. But even if the same number of people ultimately get infected with COVID-19, it's just best to space that infection over a period of time. The physical distancing measures needed may vary um, as we move along in this um, pandemic. Um, it may not always be as strict as what we currently are doing, but we're currently, um, what we're currently doing seems to be slowing that pace. Life is not likely to be completely normal again until a vaccine can be developed and widely distributed. I'd also like to mention the CDC poison control recommendations. There's been an increase in the number of calls to our poison control centers. Um, it's increased by 20% looking at January through March this year versus the previous two years. Um, the total calls across um, are across all age groups. Those children that are five years or younger are representing the largest percentage of exposure calls to the poison control centers. Uh, most of the calls are due to inhalation of cleaners and disinfectants. Bleach is accounted for the largest percentage of increase in calls. Also hand sanitizers and the non-alcohol disinfectants uh, were all, also many of the calls. So we want people to remember to prevent COVID spread, but also to clean safely. Follow the label directions. Don't mix your chemicals. You don't ever want to mix bleach with ammonia or other cleansers. Wear your gloves. Make sure you have good ventilation. And as always, store those chemicals out of the reach of children. If you need more information on cleaning and cleaning products, please refer to the CDC website, cdc.gov, for more information how to safely use those products and also how to make a safe bleach solution. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Our next speaker is medical officer from Sanford, uh, uh, Dr. Doug Griffin. He has some data and things he'd like to share with us today. He seems muted still, is coming. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to provide uh, information uh, about how Sanford is uh, protecting and working during this time uh, with our patients, staff, and, and the community. We really welcome the conversation and partnership with everybody uh, on this uh, call today. Uh, just some quick updates about the status of uh, COVID in our facility. Right now, we have a total of uh, 18 patients in our special care unit at the uh, Fargo Hospital. We've cared for 102 patients since we opened that unit on March 20th. We believe this is the majority of patients hospitalized in the state of North Dakota. And it's a credit to our team that they really have stepped up and are well prepared to continue to take care of uh, these patients within our region. Uh, we've participated in a number of uh, trials uh, so far with our patients, uh, including most recently uh, two patients enrolling in trials for convalescent plasma uh, received that, and other trials are beginning across our footprint as well. 
Uh, I'm excited to share some news uh, about uh, testing. Uh, our lab is currently validating an in-house uh, COVID-19 antibody test, such as uh, uh, Desi referred to, with a uh, capacity of 1,200 tests per day. This will be an important uh, uh, tool in determining if somebody had previously had COVID-19. Uh, and we look forward to what our new normal might be and how this test might uh, be helpful to understand uh, where we are uh, in this uh, outbreak and pandemic and how to best manage it uh, long term. Uh, continue to be developing other COVID-19 testing as a top priority uh, for us navigating this pandemic. And for the last few weeks, our lab teams have been working hard to expand in-house in testing capacities and adding rapid tests in all of our major locations. As of Monday, we uh, crossed the uh, total of 10,000 COVID-19 tests processed in uh, Sanford Laboratories. And I really wanted to take uh, this opportunity to publicly thank uh, our laboratory uh, professionals for their long hours and commitment during this National Medical Laboratory Professionals Week. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, we continue to see great success with our video and e-visits for clinic patients. We strongly encourage people to use these options for routine visits, checkups, and minor Ill illnesses. But we want to remind everyone that in-person visits are available by appointment and same-day visits and can be accommodated. It's vitally important to, uh, for children and others to keep up with scheduled va vaccinations, uh, for example. I want to close today by sharing some concerning patterns we're starting to see in our hospitals. Patients are coming to us much sicker than we used to be. We have had patients that have had conditions that they had already had pre-scheduled surgeries for, and they, um, yeah, you can put the slide up now. That would be fine. Thank you. And they delayed their surgery, but then they end up developing more significant symptoms related to the condition came to the hospital and had to be operated on urgently. When you do surgery in this situation, you raise the risk for complication and less desired outcomes, as I'm sure Dr. Mahoney uh, could attest to. And in one case we know of, unfortunately, we had a gentleman uh, that for a variety of COVID-related reasons didn't get to us for his scheduled uh, heart procedure and passed away at home, unfortunately. Is the slide displayed now? Yes, we can see the okay, slide. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So many patients have delayed appointments and, and procedures due to the pandemic. And now that it's 60 days long, we're seeing the first that the first wave of the pandemic is behind us, but there will be a pent up demand uh, for people to be cared for for their uh, conditions. So further delaying care can be very detrimental. So we want to remind people don't delay care for things like symptoms or signs of a stroke or heart attack. Don't hesitate to see a clinician uh, for known issues that you already have planned surgery for that the symptoms seem to be worsening. Confirm with your clinician if it might be best for you to be seen in person for your uh, health condition. And we have plenty of capacity to see patients. And to quote Governor Burgum, hospitals that have voluntarily stopped doing elective surgeries can start doing elective surgeries tomorrow if they see fit. We agree with this, but as always, we want to make sure this is a discussion between the provider and the patient for what is best for them and their situation. So uh, I want to continue uh, by thanking our physicians, our frontline health uh, care workers, and everybody uh, working tirelessly to keep our community safe. I know Sanford uh, and our entire Sanford family is very appreciative of everybody's support in this time. Thank you very much. We next have the Essential Health, Dr. Rich Better to speak. Great. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney. Uh, I'd also like to begin, as Dr. Griffin has said, um, to extend my gratitude to all the physicians, nurses, staff for their dedicated services these past few weeks and months, uh, but also for what they will continue to do to provide care for our patients and communities. I also want to recognize the unbelievable outpouring of support we've received from our communities for all of our healthcare workers, and I want the community to know how much we really appreciate it and the staff really appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. 
we like most organizations recognize that our people are our greatest asset. And so we're working hard to keep uh, them uh, as well as our patients as safe as possible. Uh, we continue with implementation of our continuous masking in all of our facilities. Uh, and as Kathy said, I just wanna provide some additional guidance around the use of personal masks. Um, we're recommending that people in the community use personal, personal masking, but it's really to protect others from you. It's what's called uh, source control. Uh, and we wanna make sure that there isn't um, any false sense of security by people wearing those masks. We still wanna make sure that we're doing our hand washing, we're wiping down hard surfaces, uh, we're washing and taking care of our masks appropriately. And when we wear the mask, make sure that it covers uh, both your nose and your mouth. Uh, you know, I've seen people in the community, I'm sure others of you have as well, uh, some around their neck, some around, uh, you know, the back of their neck, um, some just covering their nose, some just their mouth. So just wanna make sure that people don't get a false sense of security and are using the mask appropriately and then caring for them appropriately. We know that that all of us can be shedding uh, when we're asymptomatic. And so that's why we're recommending that people be masked when they're out in public or can't maintain appropriate social distancing. Uh, last week, I announced that we began in-house testing uh, at Essentia as well. Uh, that started in Fargo, Brainerd, and Duluth. Uh, and next week, we're going to be rolling it out to uh, a couple of our divisional sites. We'll have uh, on-site testing in Boston and Detroit Lakes as well. I know Dr. Griffin also touched a little bit on uh, the importance uh, of people making sure that they get their other health care needs met. And I want to just reiterate that uh, we don't want to up. We don't want any unintended health consequences from this pandemic. Uh, we have examples as well of people with acute conditions uh, that are not coming in when they really should be coming in. Uh, and again, we don't wanna have those unintended consequences. I wanna reassure people that we have screening tools in place. We have the proper PPE. Uh, we have the proper infection prevention measures in place to care for you when you come in. So we, we will keep you safe. Uh, those of you with subacute or chronic conditions, we want you to continue to reach out, utilize our video visits. Um, we've been doing over 3,500 of those a day. Uh, it's been a real great uh, asset to have that, to be able to care for patients in the comfort of their home and reduce the risk of having to come in uh, as well. We are gonna be doing outreach to our uh, highest risk patients, uh, those over age 65, those with multiple comorbidities or other high risk conditions, including those in our nursing facilities. Uh, by doing some remote monitoring as well as uh, virtual visits uh, in those places as well. Uh, finally, uh, as been talked about earlier, we know that this pandemic and this COVID infection in our community will, will be with us for some time and we all have to learn how we can adapt to this new reality. Uh, we're having conversations daily at Essentia about how we plan uh, to take care of our patients in a safe and effective way uh, to be able to continue to meet the acute and chronic health needs of our patients. Uh, we are monitoring uh, patients who've had surg surgical procedures and other procedures uh, delayed and making sure that we're getting them in for the care that they need. Uh, having the on-site testing has been really helpful in that regard to add that extra layer of confidence uh, that we are providing the best care for those patients. Just wanna remind all of us, including all the business owners out there that we need to get used to this new way of doing things in our community. And so really want you to continue with the ongoing mitigation strategies to reduce risk to our community. So again, the good hand hygiene, the cleaning of surfaces frequently, maintaining physical distance, uh, being innovative in how we do things and uh, be creative in developing new ways to, to deliver the services that you provide. We have the luxury of technology now that we didn't have in the past that we can do things uh, in a more and innovative way. Uh, and then just to continue to rhyme, remind people to limit unnecessary travel uh, at this time. I think there's a recognition amongst the healthcare providers as well as uh, state and public health officials around the importance of increasing testing and contact tracing. Uh, and just want people to know that the state and uh, local health agencies and health providers are working towards rapidly expanding our testing to get to as many people as possible to help with those mitigation strategies. Um, thank you for your time today. Thank you for that insight, Dr. Better and Dr. Griffin. I just wanna take a moment to thank the residents and businesses in our community are doing a rare part to battle against COVID-19. 
For example, I'm seeing many people respecting social distancing in grocery stores and pharmacies. I have often noticed the majority of the residents utilizing cloth face coverings in those stores where it may not always be possible to maintain six feet distance from each other. Grocery stores are implementing barriers between customers and cashiers. Stores are also utilizing foot signage to help remind people how far apart they should be standing. These are all promising signs that we as a community are taking this virus seriously and we're doing our parts to save lives. And as Dr. Benner said, we're a new normal, so you have to be very cognitive. We do not want to spread this. As we've already heard, we see an increased number of positive COVID tests, both state level and locally in Cass County. These numbers are not alarming and are consistent with the expectations. It is important to monitor the new positive cases, hospitalizations, and other metrics, and use data to drive decision making. I understand people are frustrated in the impacts that this pandemic has had on their lives. And as a member of the Fargo Metro community, I feel the effects of closure just like everybody else. As mayor, I must do what is right for the residents of Fargo. The city of Fargo is collaborating with Fargo Pass, Cass Public Health, our local governor partners, the North Dakota Department of Health, the North Dakota Department of Commerce, the governor's office, and our local business community to begin planning for the phased reopening of our community and our economy. The Fargo Metro will reopen, but we must be smart about how it is done. In the meantime, it's critical for everybody to activate the efforts to contain the COVID and not rush this process. As we remain apart before we can get together, there is a light at the end of this tunnel. Each of your actions will decide when the light brightens and we may proceed to a new normal. Now I'd like to introduce West Fargo Commissioner President Bernie Dardis. Brief update of the operation in our neighboring community. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney. I too would like to start first with thanking uh, Cass County and Clay County public health officials and the healthcare professionals of Essentia and Sanford for your continued updating of us as elected officials and to the public uh, and for the job that you're doing. Your first line people are putting their own lives and well-being at risk. And but the result of that is that they're they're saving our family members, our friends, and our neighbors. And we should be extremely grateful to the healthcare community for that commitment. On a daily basis, Mayor Mahoney, Commissioner Chad Peterson and myself, along with Mrs. Fleming, get together with the administrators of each of our cities and county in a unified command. So I wanna reassure the public that this discussion that we're having today once a week is actually going on every single morning. Every morning, Mrs. Fleming brings to us the news of what's happening with, with new directives of the CDC and, the, North, and North Dakota, the state of North Dakota, as well as her expertise and that of the healthcare professionals. So I wanna reassure the public that this isn't just a one hour a week type event. We are all very, very engaged in that. In addition to that, Jim from the city of Fargo, Lee, uh, uh, Jim from the Cass County, Leon from uh, the city of Fargo and Pierre from the city of West Fargo, our emergency service managers are constantly meeting also. So West Fargo Municipal Court has been closed down again until June 1st. Our, the uh, alcohol sales moratorium has been extended. Our city hall is still closed. I'm sitting here today, you know, and uh, it's a little quiet around here. <laughs> But uh, that's okay, that's what we're asking the public to do. But we're constantly updating our website and our social media channels in West Fargo to inform our residents about the services and anything that we can do to assist you. At the present time, the West Fargo Library has now developed a program and you can go onto our, their website where they're trying to assist people in finding jobs through the library. We're very proud of that. The West Fargo School District from day one has continued to serve meal, daily meals for students that are in need. And they pack a backpack for them every Friday night so they can make it through the weekend. The West Fargo Public Schools has done a marvelous job with this, this distance learning. Uh, I have grandsons that are in the, in the school system and uh, they're enjoying it. They miss their teacher immensely and they miss their friends. 
But the only way we're going to get back to the normal, the normal is through the fact that we have to continue with all the CDC guidelines and public health. By the time you get to be the fifth speaker in a, in, in a meeting like this, we can't always just continue to harp on the people about what you should be doing. My mask, when I came to City Hall today, is sitting on my desk, and I'm still wearing my gloves. <laughs> I forgot to take them off. <laughs> so we're going to continue to ask you folks on a daily basis, please follow the guidelines of these healthcare professionals. They absolutely are making a difference on keeping the numbers down. Dr. Vetter quoted Governor Burgum a few minutes ago, and I'm going to too today. As he's come through this whole process and the educational process from state government, they've tried extremely hard to make us understand that we control the destiny of how we come out of this event. The social distancing, the washing the hands, all of those items that these healthcare professionals and our elected officials are sharing with us, we control our own destiny on how soon we can reopen up. So to quote Governor Burgum, North Dakota, let's do a smart restart. And by that, the next several weeks, please do be as vigilant and diligent as you can of following the guidelines. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you, Bernie. Now we go to the East, Moorhead Mayor Jonathan Judd. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney, and greetings to everyone. Um, I'm really proud again of what we're all doing as a Metro, uh, working as a team uh, to make sure that we're keeping our community safe, healthy, but also being responsive to the needs of our residents. Uh, as far as the city update goes, uh, our workforce uh, remains on the job as far as our, our city staff. Uh, can, uh, we continue to provide essential public services. Uh, the employees are working in certain areas, staggered shifts, and uh, the majority of our staff continues to telework as much as possible. Uh, also, the biggest change that we have in the city right now that might be exciting to some is the reopening of the golf courses uh, on uh, Tuesday with the health protocols recommended by the CDC, which uh, includes uh, spacing of tea times, which are arranged 14 minutes apart. But people should know if you're signing up for a, a tea time, obviously that will be online, but there are no carts, no food or beverage services uh, at this time. And my understanding is that the golfers are cooperating with those restrictions. Also, uh, just so people are aware, uh, obviously the uh, city continues to frequently monitor uh, the Minnesota health updates and executive orders. Uh, last week, <clears throat> the state modified the liquor regulations to allow a limited sale of liquor with food pickup, which is similar to North Dakota's current uh, policy. Also of note is that the Moorhead uh, Fire Department is joining fire departments across Minnesota with a statewide collection of masks uh, on Saturday. So collection will be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at both the downtown station on uh, 12th Street North and at station two at 20th Street and 24th Avenue South. Homemade and store purchase masks will be graciously accepted and distributed uh, to our congregate living facilities for residents and employees. Now I think for right now, that's all I have, but I do before I uh, pass it over, uh, to say happy Administrative Professionals Day uh, to everyone in the region, uh, whether you're working uh, at your respective offices or at your new office at home, thank you for all the work that you do uh, for everyone because without you, obviously, we couldn't do our work. So happy Admin Professionals Day. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Next, we have Cass County Commissioner Chad Peterson. Thank you, Mayor. As I've been working from my house and doing these remote meetings, I've learned that I either need to redo my lighting in my office or grow some hair. I'm not <laughs> quite sure which is the right answer, but uh, pardon the glare to everyone watching. So first of all, thank you to everyone for quarantining, working from home, and socially distancing. And a special thank you, as always, to our first responders, healthcare workers, as well as business owners and staff that are patiently waiting to reopen. I know the times are anxious. I know the times are stressful. 
We appreciate everything you're doing. Know this, your governmental office within Cass County are doing our part, as always. The Cass County Courthouse is still open, but by appointment only. Public meeting attendance continues to be held remotely. As an example of that, this Monday's commission meeting was held live, broadcast to the public, and you were able to watch us as we proceeded. This will be the same moving forward throughout this pandemic. The Cass County Jail is operational and safe. We currently have 149 customers, three of which are positive with COVID. These three occupants are isolated in negative airflow cells, making sure the staff and other occupants are kept safe. Human services also open. Economic assistance forms can be started by visiting our website or calling directly. Staff from all departments are still on site to answer phone calls, start intake processes, or hold urgent, by appointment only again, meetings with our clients. Our goal, as always, is to ensure the needs of our community are met. Veteran services are also still available. We're seeing veterans by appointment only again. The best day is Tuesday, because every Tuesday, the North Dakota BSO office is also present in our office. So again, if you want to see someone in person, the best day is Tuesday. That number is 701-241-5746 to set up an appointment. Now the election on June 9th, North Dakota, North Dakota residents will receive a letter later this week from the North Dakota Secretary of State, Al Jagger. Included in this letter will be an application for an absentee ballot. Please complete the absentee ballot application. You need to vote. You need to complete it and mail it back to the county auditor, which is our finance director in CAS, to get an absentee ballot. Information can be found at cascountynd.gov backslash elections. Please, I know this is an uncomfortable situation too. We want our ballots to be cast in person, but we have to be able to proceed. We have to keep you safe. We have to keep the people that will be working there safe. Please vote, please participate. And as always, again, we're providing all county services as we always have and we potentially always will. The public can find information available at county services at www.cascountynd.gov and stay up to date with our Twitter, our Facebook at the at Cass County Gov ND site. So Mr. Mayor, that's all I have. Again, thank you to everyone on the call. Thank you to everyone listening. Thank you, Chad. We next have Clay County Commissioner Jim Haney. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney. The governors of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky will work in close coordination to reopen the economy. Decisions will be based on facts, science, and recommendations from experts in healthcare, business, labor, and education. According to the Department of Employment and Economic Development, approximately 14% of the Minnesota labor force is temporarily out of work now. The agency reports that it has received twice as many unemployment applications in the last month than in all of 2019. Approximately 219,000 Minnesotans applied for unemployment benefits last year, and in the last 30 days, more than 451,000 people have applied. Governor Walz signed an executive order last week permitting the state's residents to partake in outdoor recreational activities while continuing social distancing guidelines. The changes will allow Minnesotans to continue to enjoy the outdoors while still doing their part to keep their neighbors healthy by maintaining six foot, six foot social distancing, avoiding crowded areas and staying close to home. The outdoor activities now permitted are golfing, fishing, boating, hunting and hiking. If you follow the new outdoor recreation guidelines from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. It is important for us to stay active and enjoy the outdoors while preventing the spread of COVID-19. Thank you, Mayor Maloney. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for this involvement today. Virtual went pretty well. We could see you all very well and hear you very well. I think one of the big takeaways, if you have a healthcare issue, they will protect you, make sure you don't get the virus when you go through their facilities, but please see your doctors or providers that you need to see for your normal healthcare because we don't want you to have neglected healthcare and have a worse problem. So thank you everybody for participating today. Stay safe, thank you.